I'll wait for the dryer. Our dryer sings to us when it's done. It's very sweet. Attention! At ease! Hello everybody, welcome back to Booth Camp. I am your instructor, Andrew Scott. And today we're going to have a kind of a uncomfortable discussion about a couple things, well, technically three things, that you might not think actually have anything to do with each other, but they do. And that is your demo and ethics. Now, as you're likely aware, a demo reel is a small little audio file, normally about eh, 60 to 90 seconds long, that you send out in order to solicit work. Or in some cases, maybe solicit for representation with an agency. You're also likely aware that they're really important to your business. Now, here's that technicality. There's another version of that type of reel that's often sent out. And it's called a sizzle reel. Now the difference between a demo and a sizzle is that a demo reel is any of a number of different things that you could be reading to the camera, while a sizzle reel is made up of projects that you've done for pay, woven together, and eh, sent out effectively to kind of flex and show work that you've done in the past. So a demo reel is material that has not been done for pay, while a sizzle reel is material that has been deployed out into the wild. Okay, so we've got some terms defined, but we need to define one more term for this discussion, and that is ethics. Now, ethics is a little bit of a squidgier term, and full disclosure, my academic background is in philosophy, but I'm not going to hit you with all sorts of, you know, Plato, categorical, imperative, Descartes, or is it okay to eat steak au cheval? Because, you know, that'd be putting Descartes before the horse. Anyway, ethics essentially means principles that govern someone's behavior or the doing of a thing. Okay? That's ethics. So, in the voiceover realm, there are all sorts of long-running battles. Things like pay-to-play sites, which, you know, I've talked about slightly before, and you can check it out here. Or something like the constant and never-ending USB microphone debate, which I'll probably cover at another time. But one of the longest pitch battles in all of VO is what we're going to talk about today, and it's coming up shortly. Now, I try to be agnostic when it comes to a lot of topics as they pertain to home VO work. A lot of that is because I'm on this side of the mic or camera and you're over there and I can't really properly inform you about things because I don't know you, your situation, your budget, all sorts of things. The other part of my agnosticism is that I ain't the boss of you, which I'm 100% sure you're glad about. I can't tell you what to do or how to go about doing it for the most part. I can only talk about me, what I've done in the past, and what I'll probably do in the future. But there are times where I really feel like I'm a voice in the wilderness. And this is certainly one of those topics. That's because today's topic is, should you use brand names in your demo? Now, this blew up again on Reddit a few days ago, and I figured it was probably a good topic here for Booth Camp, so let's dig into it. First off, you have to understand that there are a lot of different tiers in the VO hiring process, but the person that you'll most likely be familiar with is someone referred to as a casting director. Now, a casting director can be anybody from a solo content creator and entrepreneur all the way up to the I don't know, vice president of rubber band balls at some large talent agency. Short form is, the casting director is the person who is making the decision about hiring you to do voice work. It's safe to say that if they're doing the hiring, they're the casting director. 
So aside from being a voice talent and narrator myself, one of the other hats that I often wear is that of a casting director. I've done this for clients of mine that may be looking for voice talent and don't feel that mine is the right voice, but they want me to help them make the decision, or for them to bring on to their in-house roster. Now, I mention this not to show off or anything, but to let you know that I'm speaking to this particular issue from both sides of the microphone. Okay, so if you spent any time digging around the interwebs on this topic, you'll know that there are two sides to this ongoing conflict. Those who say, go ahead, do it, it's no big deal, everybody does it, even the pros do it, to people who say, don't ever do it. Now, full disclosure, I'm in the latter camp, but not for the reasons that you might suspect. Here's the deal. I say don't do it, partly out of ethics but mostly because it's not necessary. On the ethical side of things, I say don't do it because those names, those brand names, are trademarked and copyrighted. And as a person working in this industry, you should be respecting trademarks and copyrights. That should go without saying, but there, I just said it again. If you do, yes, there is a chance that ginormouscorporation.com could come after you, but honestly, that's really probably not going to happen. You're more likely to get in trouble for that Tinkerbell tattoo that you got on your left butt cheek back when you turned 18. You're more likely to get hit by an asteroid, if I'm being honest. And I am. Short form, yeah, you're likely to get away with it, no problem. So. If it's no big deal, then where's the problem? If everybody's already doing it, why care? Well, here's the other side of that coin. And to discuss that, I need to put on my casting director hat. What? Casting directors wear fezzes. Fezzes are cool. Right then, I have questions. But number one is this. What in the name of sanity have you got on your head? It's a fez. I wear a fez now. Fezzes are cool. Anywho, oh! truth of the matter is, casting directors, casting directors like me and other casting directors, don't give a turd and a fez about you using a brand name. That doesn't impress us. That doesn't get our attention. That doesn't perk our ears up. What does is a good, quality read. End stop. Period. The truth is, the two types of people who use brand names in their demos when they shouldn't are A. Talent that doesn't know what they're doing. And B. Do you get A and B on your fingers? People who go to professional voice studios in order to have a demo created for them. We often refer to these as demo mills. The people at the demo mill will often have you do this. Well, if it's wrong to do, why are they doing it? The answer is simple sleight of hand. They know that you as a new voice talent really, really want to say those big, sexy brand names. They know that you, in the back of your head, think that when you get to say those names, you're making it. You're there. You're in the big leagues. Now, the truth is, they know you want to feel and sound like a pro. And the pros get to do that, right? This is nothing more than a simple sales trick. It's sleight of hand in order to make the buyer, in this case, the VO talent, feel like they're getting value for money from the crazy expensive costs these demo mills charge. Now, people all over the interwebs keep squawking at me saying, It's essential! A casting director needs to hear how you say those big brand names in order to judge how you'll get people to affiliate with their brand, or else the demo production company wouldn't have you do it! Yeah, no. Want to know what will really impress and get the attention of a casting director? Getting you to care about a brand that doesn't even exist. 
I agree that a lot of producers get talent to do this for various reasons. I agree that a lot of people appear to be doing this on the regular. What I don't agree with is the everybody and all the good ones and the pros do this. This is not a unilateral issue with only one answer. Talent always says it is so after they spent a thousand dollars on a demo reel and want to feel like they didn't waste their money and wind up shooting themselves in the foot by doing something outside the lines. Casting directors like me see right through this, and we judge the read and delivery by the talent alone, irrespective of any brand names being bandied about. This can also bite you squarely in that Tinkerbell tattoo. And here's why. I work off and on for two national agencies. And when I get a demo sent to me that uses brand names, the very first thing I do is reach out to the talent, introduce myself, and ask them for references for ginormocorporation.com spot that they appear to have done because it's on their demo reel. Yeah, that makes for some very embarrassing emails for somebody. Now, we don't normally hold it against talent, especially if we find out that the talent went through a demo mill in order to get a demo to send to us. We understand that quite often the talent doesn't really know what they're doing in an actual studio, and they just follow directions. Unfortunately, the directions that they've been given are coming from people who really are only concerned about cranking you out a demo and getting a couple thousand dollars. Yeah, it can be that much. We don't normally hold it against them, again, because it's not what we were listening for in the first place. Also, and to go back to that technicality, there's a difference between sending somebody a demo reel and sending somebody a sizzle reel. If we get a sizzle reel and it's got brand names in it, we just go, okay, this is work that that person's done and good for you, and we still listen for the read. If we get a demo reel that's got brands in it, we assume it's a sizzle reel, and we have the right to ask for those references. Demos are there to demonstrate ability. Things like diction, enunciation, pronunciation, intonation, interpretation of copy, putting emotion in a read, that sort of thing. Sizzle reels are to demonstrate work that has already been done and deployed. It doesn't matter if it's for pay or not. It does mean that it's work that's already been launched out into the wild. People often confuse the terms and try to use them interchangeably, but they're not the same. When we get a sizzle, we expect to hear brand names. When we get something called a demo, we don't. And so when we get a demo that's got brand names in it, we tend to raise an eyebrow. Why? Because if you float a demo out there with brand names, we assume it's a sizzle because that's what the industry does. And if we find out that it's not, we've got questions. So when we do, and you answer back honestly that you haven't done those spots, I said things that weren't true. You look really stupid because you've effectively been caught lying. And that's no good way to operate your business, especially if you're new talent. Do you want to muddy your name right off the bat? No, you don't. Trust me. Worse, you're now embarrassed and you look as far away from that pro you want to be considered as, as possible. But what about all those demos that are on big agency websites that use brand names? Well, the answer is really simple there. Those large agencies that represent all different kinds of talent, they have working arrangements with hundreds, if not thousands of brand names. And they pay a stipend to those companies to be able to use their names, their brands, that way, for that purpose. So here's an example. Somebody that I produced a demo for about a month or so ago just got signed to a big agency down in LA. All right, good stuff. 
they got hired on the back of my demo that I produced with them that used no brand names whatsoever. I wrote all that script myself. It's part of the benefit of being a writer as well. Now, what's going to happen is my student who got hired from that demo is going to be brought in-house and record a demo for the agency that uses brand names. And that demo is going to go up on the agency's website. Simple. An agency that big is not going to be using brand names without legal protection. They're not going to be flying by the seat of their pants and just doing it and hoping they don't get caught. The truth of the matter is, they're more likely to get sued than you because they're the one with money. So remember, what you may hear on an agency website is almost never the demo that got the talent there in the first place. It's second or maybe even third generation. So if, say, you've done this in the past, I'm not calling you out on it personally, okay? Because I'm not you, I don't know your circumstances, and I'm not really here to judge anybody. What I'm trying to do is give a different view on this, a larger view. Because most people who talk about this on the interwebs aren't casting directors. They're talent. And talent always wants to feel like they're doing something good. Talent never wants to think that they're getting caught doing something bad or coloring outside the lines. Helicopter. You really should be concerned with being an honest operator. There's no question about that. You really should be abiding by ethical standards of content use. Trademarks. Brand names. Those are things that you should be concerned about. But more than anything, you shouldn't have to use brand names in your demo. Because as I just illustrated by talking to you about my student who just got signed, it's not necessary. That's not what we're listening for. There's really only one way to impress a casting director, and that is with a well-delivered, well-modulated read. Period. End stop. Anything else is superfluous and not really relevant. As a voice talent, you should be able to talk convincingly about anything. And here's an example. So, one of the bigger names in our industry is Mike Rowe. Yeah, the guy from Dirty Jobs. Now, these days, he's more likely to be doing work behind the mic than he is in front of the camera. But he's got a famous story that he tells about one of his first big breaks. So, he and a buddy of his were at a bar in New York having a drink in the afternoon, watching TV like you do. And one of their compatriots comes over and tells him that there's an audition across the street. His buddy throws down 100 bucks and bets him that he can't get a call back. So Mike Rowe gets up, shoots his drink, runs across the street, dodging traffic, crashes the audition, and gets the job on the spot. Now, there are a couple of other details here. First off, at the time, Mike Rowe wasn't any kind of on air talent. Mike Rowe was in the performing arts. He was an opera singer, and he and his buddy were on the matinee break of a Wagnerian opera, dressed as Vikings. The other thing is that the audition that he crashed was for the QVC shopping channel. Oh, and the audition? Yeah, everybody who was there on purpose was told days earlier to come in prepared to talk about something passionately and convincingly to show how they could be persuasive about something. Unlike all the prepared people, Mike didn't have a pitch or anything in mind. So what did he do? He walked over to the casting director's desk, picked up a pencil, and talked for 10 minutes persuasively and passionately about the virtues of a random pencil. Again, if you're good, you can talk persuasively and passionately and authentically about anything. Doesn't have to have a brand name on it, just a pencil. Dressed as a Viking. It's not what you're saying, it's how you deliver it. Mike Rowe 
didn't need to lean on a brand name to start his career. Why do you? Anyways, go get in your box, cozy up to your microphone, and talk about anything. Make up brand names, write your own scripts, or get a hold of me and ask for help doing so. There's plenty of material out there you can use, like my student did, to make a perfectly good, perfectly professional level demo that will get you work. It's not as hard as you think. And as a bonus, no asshole casting director like me will catch you fibbing. Your ethics have a value beyond the face of a bill. And trust me, if you're ready and your read is there, it won't matter what you're selling, even if it is a Ticonderoga number two. Anyways, go get to work. Build yourself something. Throw it out there and see what happens. That's what I got for you this week. I'm Andrew Scott. This has been Booth Camp. Take care, everybody. You're dismissed.